Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, just to confirm that you're on the right flight, this, <laughs> this is the diaspora collaboration among early career researchers. Um, I'm Kevin Finneran. I'm the director of the Committee on Science Engineering and Public Policy at the National Academy of Sciences. And um, I'm interested in this subject because we're in the process now of doing a study of the postdoctoral system in the United States. And all the expertise is up here on the panel, so you won't hear much from me. But um, except to say that the, the reason that we're doing this study is it really initiated from the, the president of the National Academy of Sciences, who became aware that there are, are real concerns um, in the US in the postdoctoral system. Um, the number of people coming in, the, the, the suitability of the training for um, for academic positions and for non-academic positions, and also in particular the, the international character of the postdoctoral system in the United States. Um, over half, maybe we're not sure exactly how many, but up to 60% of the people doing postdoctoral training in the United States are non-citizens. So it's clear that even in the United States, the research community is an international community. And so we're very interested in the experience of those students who come here, um, why could students come here, where they go afterwards after completing their postdocs. So we're in the process of learning that, and we're hoping we'll learn something from the discussion today. Um, so that's the extent of my introduction. I'll quickly line up, um, give you the order of the speakers and what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to start with Kathy Johnson Phillips, who is the director of the U.S. National Postdoctoral Association, will give us a, a broad overview of postdoctoral training in, in the United States. And then we're going to have Laurie Conlin, who um, manages postdoctoral services for the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest funder of postdoctoral training in the United States and site of the largest number of postdocs in the United States. Um, then um, Vatsilea, who um, works with one of the international groups at NIH um, because there's a large you know, postdoctoral population and, and organization, but there are also national groups within that, and he's going to talk about that. And then um, Garrett is here from GAIN, which is the uh, German advanced me up to German Academic International Network. Very good, thank you. And, uh, and he's going to talk about um, another type of, of independent organization that's looking at the postdocs who come do their training here to see if they've been, you know, check their interests on returning to their countries. And I think in, in a larger sense, um, maintaining the international circulation of people with scientific and engineering medical training. Um, in some ways, that's what this is really about, what the, I think the diaspora is about, is maintaining a really interactive and lively community um, so we don't segment into our little national pockets. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kathy. And um, each of them is, I'll tell you, they're given seven and a half minutes to do their introduction, and I'll be signaling to them to stop because we want to get all of the presentations done before the first half is over so that we have lots of time for interaction with all of you through the whole second half. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Well, I'm glad to be here today, and I uh, just want to give you a very quick overview. Um, just so that you know the context from which I'm speaking, I want to tell you just a little bit about the National Postdoctoral Association um, before I get into the international postdoc information. So our, we were founded just about 10 years ago in 2003 by seven postdocs. And the mission was to improve that experience through collabor collaboration with all the stakeholders in the postdoctoral community, the funding agencies, the universities, and the postdocs themselves. And we are mostly focused on improving the professional development of the postdocs right now so that they can have a very good career prospect. Um, we are a nonprofit. So right now we have 185 institutional members and we, they have to report to us how many postdocs they have at their institutions. And they have reported that among all of them, not including our professional societies, just the research institutions, they, have, they employ or train 60,000 postdocs. So we, um, we, our membership represents the majority of the postdoc population in the United States. Nearly two thirds of our institutional members are identified as very high research activity institutions by the Carnegie, Cla Carnegie classification. And 52 of them, of the 61 members of the 
Association of American Universities are members of the MPA. So we have a, a very good representation of research and development in the academic world in the United States. We also have nearly 3,000 individual members. In 2011, we um, surveyed our members, and of those that responded, more than half of them said that more than 50% of the postdocs at their institutions were here on temporary visas. And that falls in line with the data that Kevin already mentioned. The National Science Foundation and Statistics uh, Office estimates there's about 60% of the 90,000 postdocs in the United States are here on temporary visas. So that's why it's so important that we interact with you all today. Um, there is a definition of a postdoc for those of you that might not know what a postdoc is. Um, the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and National Postdoctoral Association worked together to arrive at a definition in 2007. The key words in that definition are, it's a, a new PhD recipient within probably three to five to seven years of their degree who has entered a period of temporary mentored advanced training after they get their PhD. And the key words are advanced training, mentored, and temporary. It, it, the definition is, although that's been established, a lot of people have their own definition for postdoc. And when you go to an academic institution, they may be called a research associate, they may be called a postdoctoral scholar, they may be called a visiting scholar. They have all different titles assigned to them by the research institution. So I've already mentioned 90, there's approximately 90,000 in the United States that we know of. Now I should say this, and this is where those of you, some of you may be able to help me today, is that the data that we do have on postdocs is mostly about the postdocs who earn their degree in the United States. So if you have postdocs in the United States on temporary visas that earn their PhD at institutions outside the United States, I don't have hardly any data on those mm -hmm. postdocs. And so everything I'm saying to you today is reflective of the best available data, but there is a huge gap in our data set. And I just want you to be aware of that. Um, you know, until about five years ago, the number of researchers on, that came to take postdoc positions on temporary visas in the United States was increasing. Like from the 70s through the mid, uh, this past decade, it was steadily increasing. And then they think, one person, one economist has suggested because of the 2008 economic downturn, that's when it started to decrease. And so the number of international researchers that take postdoc positions is going down according to the best available data, again. So that may not be true because I don't know what the postdocs, you know, about the postdocs who earn their degree in countries outside of the United States. And this is a little bit of a concern, I think, for some people with the discussion about brain drain. So they do contribute, uh, the COSIFUT committee that Kevin was referring to, they did a study on postdocs in the year 2000 and or so, and it did say that they make significant contributions to research in the United States. And even so far, some have said to do the bulk of the research, and I'm talking about the actual research that happens at, in the labs and in the field. And so they're very important, and, but perhaps most importantly, they are the future of research and development in the United States. They are early career res researchers who are going to be tomorrow's leaders. And so it's really important that we address the issues that they're facing. And so there are issues that all postdocs face, not just those here on temporary visas. A lot of them have a sense of disenfranchisement, like they don't belong anywhere. They complain about the mentoring that they receive. Um, it, the complaints I've heard have changed rather significantly um, in the last five years that I've been executive director of the MPA in terms of what people call us about or email us about. So five years ago when I first started at the MPA, a lot of it was about we don't earn enough money, right? That was mostly what we heard, okay? But now what I'm getting more phone calls and emails about are career prospects. They are now very worried about what they're going to do after their postdoc. And there are issues, there are four main issues besides career prospects for international postdocs that have, the one that we most often get contacted about are, is for help with visa concerns. They just don't understand the laws about visas. They need help, what should I do? The next one is they're often unaware of their basic workplace rights. They may come from countries that provide better or no benefits, they don't know what they're entitled to. And they also need a, a career guidance as we've already mentioned, and then the cultural and language differences that cause problems between them and their supervisor. So those are the four main issues that they face. 
In order to deal with these issues, we try to provide resources. We have international officers, to whom I will refer them, that have been international postdocs and understand the system. We have international postdoc survival guide, quick guide to visa, some of our online resources. We also um, offer legal seminars, seminars for international postdocs. And Brendan Delaney is here today, if you want to raise your hand, Brendan. He's a longtime friend of postdocs in the MPA. He knows everything you, know, you, you want to know about visa issues. And his firm, I know I just probably exaggerated it, right? <laughs> and his firm um, really helps postdocs to understand the system of visas. And so the things that we really are looking at and the MPA to help with postdocs who are not in their home country but are working here in the United States, because that's the context in which I'm speaking, it's just from the United States context, is what resources they need to succeed. And we want to know how they're treated in other countries. And to close, that's the, the in trying to gather that information, how postdocs, or sometimes they're called research staff, and other titles in other countries are treated. We have joined with 10 other countries from around the world to start the International Consortium of Research Staff Associations. And we're one of those that are working to start a global discussion about uh, these early career researchers and what we can do to support them. And so if you have resources and know any information you can share with me, it would be much appreciated. Thank you, Kathy. We're going to hold questions in, until the end, I think. So, Lori. Great. Well, thanks for inviting me and play, playing with us this afternoon. I am Lori Conlon. I run the postdoc office for the Intramural Research Program of the National Institutes of Health. Um, I also am involved in a lot of conversations across the United States about what we're doing for postdoc education, uh, specifically related around career education. So my office is focused around two things. Our um, mission is to um, uh, augment the research that happens in the laboratories at the National Institutes of Health and the research groups there with career information. And we focus on career exploration. Uh, what are you gonna do with that degree? So what kind of career options are available? Uh, the current statistics in the United States are that for PhDs that are minted in the United States, about 12 to 20% will get tenure track faculty positions but that's what we're training everybody to go off and do. And so my job is to help them to realize that there are other career options out there besides just tenure track faculty positions, as well as helping them get those tenure track faculty positions if that is what they would like to do. The other thing that we focus on in our office is skill development. This is how do you actually get a job? So how do you build a resume? How do you interview? How do you, um, how do you write a cover letter? How do you manage people, those kind of things, so skill development, because we're finding that most of these uh, early career researchers, when we say that we mean there are people in their 30s, um, have never written a resume, have never looked for a job, don't know what the process of looking for a job actually is, have never managed someone, and come from a culture, especially in the biomedical research world, um, a culture of research that no one has ever taught anyone how to manage other people. So we're trying to fix that. And so my office does that for our 4,000 postdocs that are at the NIH, as well as we coordinate with other postdoc offices from around the country. So we have a very large network. We provide a lot of our opportunities online at training.nih.gov, and so we have video casts on how to build a resume, and video casts on um, preparing for an academic job search, or video casts on um, how to get a job in industry that are available to anyone around the world. They're, they're open access um, articles. Now this is specifically, we want to talk about our international population. Again, we have 4,000 postdocs, well, 3,600 nowadays, um, at the <coughs> NIH. Of those, about 60% are foreign. And so we have definitely some pockets that most people come from, and this is not true just at the NIH, but across the the uh, United States as well. China, India, Japan um, are, are three largest uh, importers of scientific talent. Um, so for those international populations, we've provided a couple of very distinct resources for them, mostly preparing them for improving their spoken English. As you come to a new country, one of the biggest challenges is making sure that you can speak the language wherever that is. And so we have provided some English training to help people get through. 
We also provide culture training. So these are Friday afternoon um, discussions on, last month it was, how do you tip? in the United States, so. <laughs> it, yeah, exactly, right? So it's the, the little things to make sure that their lives are a little bit better. Um, we also provide, not only for the International Fellows, but for all of our, our trainees at the NIH, writing courses. So um, uh, this one is on basic scientific writing, and the other one is writing and publishing a scientific paper. Those are free, all of our stuff are free for our fellows on campus. Um, we also provide a how do you become a teacher course, um, how do you be a manager course, um, I'm sure much mother, many others that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Um, we find that our visiting fellows um, also take very good advantage of our career counselors to help them figure out what's next in their career life. Again, remember these are folks in their 30s. I was a one, I was a postdoc once. Um, who realized that I didn't know what to do with this degree now that I had it. And so we provide career counselors so that you can actually help someone walk through the process of getting a job. And this is very common across the United States of what postdoc offices are offering. I think ours is a little bit on steroids, that we offer more than most of the postdoc offices in the nation. Um, but it is because our population is so large. We're also governmental based, and so we feel that it's our duty as for the taxpayers to provide as much as we can to not only the rest of the United States, but also to the world. Um, one of the things I think the biggest challenge I think for our international fellows is either staying in the United States, if that's something you wanna do, how do you manage that? But even more importantly is if you want to go home or to any other country, how do you navigate that? So we talk about how to build a CV, or we talk about how to build a resume, but we don't know how to build a resume for every single country. So if you wanna go back to Singapore, I have no idea what a resume looks like in Singapore. I don't know how to interview in Singapore. I don't know what's expected of a job hunt across the world. So that's something that the next group of postdoc offices is really going to have to tackle, is how do we help the brain circulation across the world, doesn't matter where you wanna go. So that's one thing that I think the diaspora community can really participate in a conversation, is how do we help job searches around the world? So, and I will leave it at that, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Vatsali, I'm a physician by training, and uh, I have real international experience with my uh, medical degree from Luxembourg and Ukraine, and uh, having another degree post-graduation in India, and then two masters in the US. So I realized what happened at different stages and what I lack being here, even though going through the program. So I'm a visiting fellow at NIH, and I'm a co-chair of uh, a visiting fellow committee, which is under uh, the FELCOM group at NIH, uh, which is a fellows committee. So we realized that there are more things that lack when a visiting fellow or a postdoctoral fellow. Once that person arrives in US, which is to start with, they don't know how they can build their resume, how to interact, what are the communication skills they need. Is it just being good at research that would make them be better faculty? or is it the managerial skills that would help them going to the next level? So we started thinking about it, and uh, in that process, we made a lot of teams that can help provide those resources of what a postdoc would need to understand, obtain, and use those in their future career. In this process, we made several teams, and uh, some of them then, uh, that I'm gonna relate to are Science Voices from Home, where we bring in uh, the speakers from different parts of the world. Once they provide their lecture on their scientific agenda, we bring them in to have a one-to-one -one talk with the international fellows, and that meeting's agenda completely changes. It becomes to how you're gonna succeed while going back to your country or a different country. What it takes in that country to be successful. So the visiting fellows who are here at NIH, they get a first-hand knowledge of what it takes if, when they are going back to get a position at a certain 
advanced level beyond a digital service status at all. The second team that I'm going to talk to is the newsletter team. In this, we provide opportunities for the visiting fellows to uh, get exposure in writing, editorial, as well as uh, write about the, their experiences of what it took them to get a job within a US or outside, or in a third country where they, you know, for example, if they are from India, if they want to go to China, what did it take for them to go to a third country, get a, a job, and what were the steps that one person took? So we provide that in the newsletter, and these teams are governed by team leaders and members of those teams. The third one, which is a very elaborate one, it's an exposition. We uh, conduct this exposition every two years now, and it includes various sections, which is uh, bringing in uh, representatives from embassies, from scientific societies or uh, agencies from abroad and here, or from multinational scientific companies, and ask them to provide their information through exhibition or talks, as well as experiences from those postdocs who have gone abroad and successfully obtained a position at the next level. So it provides a very good platform, not only for visiting fellows, as well as the fellows who are at NIH, to understand of how, what is the course of uh, acceptance portfolio for a postdoc who is going abroad, or who is uh, trying to get a position in not only in science, but in media, in um, ed editorial world, or in policy, or in something else like government, to take a position in a different country, which is very important to understand that um, a very small proportion of people in science stay after a certain level. They would go to policy, they would go to editorial, or do something else as a policy maker or something. So we understood this fact, and then uh, we tried to implement that. The fourth one was uh, the communication, uh, <coughs> um, in which uh, we tried to um, integrate our our system in which uh, we interact with Telecom, and then we interact with the country groups, and then we interact with the team members. So how we laid out these programs where um, <coughs> we receive all the information from Telecom, and whatever is relevant to, VF, uh, to the visiting fellows, we disseminate in them through the country group channel and ask them what you need from us to be a platform to the fellows committee or to other committees that are existing with us or communicating with us. In that, we understand what those specific countries, the postdocs from those specific countries they require. So in that way, we understand what are their expectations and how should we respond to them so that it meets their expectations as well. The third thing that was very important for us was uh, how to make them get the skills. So for each team, we try to give them independence of uh, do you want to be a manager of that team? So we have a democratic system in which we elect the team leaders and the participants in those teams. And then we ask them, why don't you play this role, be independent, take this charge, get team members, and work around them. So each team actually becomes an independent unit within the visiting fellow committee. But it has layered way of communication in which each of the layer of visiting fellow team interacts with each other, reciprocates to each other needs, as well as puts up agenda at the visiting fellow committee executive board. So in that way, we just not only interact with them, we also interact with the fellows committee at NIH, as well as different team members and country groups, understand their needs and become a platform for them to interact and give a very <coughs> good communication bridge, which can meet the goals of the postdocs from different countries. 
and Gary. Yeah, um, so when we discussed this panel uh, before today, I already felt a little bit like the Audubon out in it. Now I do even more so because uh, what my organization does sort of reverses a lot of the a lot of the energy that you guys are spending in a way. Uh, because we're not so much about um, helping the German diaspora fit in better or um, help them with their uh, their careers here in the United States, but we want to convince them to come back to Germany. Um, on the other hand, uh, GAIN, so my organization, is, uh, is a joint initiative of the three major funding organizations in Germany, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the uh, German Academic Exchange Service, and uh, the German Research Foundation. Uh, we're also here present in the, in the audience through uh, some of their representatives. And it's these organizations that send um, a lot of German postdocs into the United States and all over the world in the first place. So um, basically, uh, a lot of the uh, German fellows at the NIH, for example, are funded through uh, German taxpayer money, to put it uh, a little uh, bluntly. And then uh, it is our job, so to speak, to, to help them come back so that we get our return on investment. Uh, which also means that I represent, uh, towards the diaspora community, sort of the, the interest of the German Taxpayer. That sounds all very unromantic, but it's uh, certainly um, not quite uh, as uh, economic as we as we think. But but it's I just wanted to show how our perspective differs, perhaps um, a little bit. Um, so what do we actually do? We have about four thousand five hundred people registered in our network right now. That number is a little bit accumulative over the last 10 years. We were actually founded around the same time that the National Postal Association was. I was surprised to hear that. Um, and uh, we sent a monthly newsletter, and we, we know that about 2,000 out of those 4,500 people read this newsletter. Whoever works with this type of um, uh, way of communicating knows that a 50% opening rate and reading rate of your newsletter, that's pretty good, actually. Um, so what we try to do is, uh, it was already mentioned, the types of difficulties people have when they come here um, in terms of maintaining their networks with home, right? So a lot of the organizations that, that I represent fund postdocs up to two years, but a lot of people stay on five, six, sometimes seven years. And if you spend seven years in a different research system, academic system, um, especially when the institution you work for does a really good job of training you for the job market, in this case in the United States and Canada, it's very difficult to translate those skills and go back to your home country uh, if you haven't been specifically trained for that job market as well. So that's where we come in. We try to um, connect our members to representatives from German universities, from German research organizations, from uh, private sector companies that, that work <coughs> largely in re research. Uh, we also show alternative career paths in Germany. Um, and we do that by bringing the experts from Germany here. We have one large conference once a year uh, where around uh, 300 Germans currently working in the United States and Canada meet about 150 representatives from Germany. So. Um, that's two to one, if you, if you will. Um, and, and these representatives coming from Germany, they're very high-ranking officials. They're university pre uh, presidents, they're presidents of those funding organizations. They're um, sometimes grant holders themselves. So if somebody uh, got a fantastic grant in Germany after coming back from, say, Berkeley or um, NIH, for example, they can come and speak firsthand to how that compares to their uh, work and life here. Great, so I made all these notes and now I just kind of ran all over them, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, what is the number one challenge uh, that our clientele, let's say, faces when they when they come back? I already mentioned they don't necessarily have the right networks to, um, to find the right jobs, to know the right people in Germany. Uh, we can help with that by, by helping them uh, maintain, establishing these uh, networks. But there are also soft factors. It was already mentioned, um, how do I write a resume in Germany versus a resume in Canada or the United States? But it's also 
Uh, I've been here in the United States for seven years. I've met somebody, perhaps, perhaps another German, but perhaps also somebody from uh, America or from a third country. This person is also a scientist. How does this person find a job in Germany? How do we deal with the with the dual career couples <laughs> like that? What happens uh, if I um, if children are involved and so on? So we can help with that, not necessarily by finding people and their spouses' jobs, but we can help by networking them with the right people who can help. Um, so we cooperate with a lot of uh, national networks in Germany, and we consider ourselves sort of a single entry point to these things, <laughs> to these uh, different organizations. Um, so researchers come to us, and we can then direct them elsewhere. Um, so briefly, uh, what are our tools? Uh, over the years, uh, like I said, we've been around for roughly 10 years. We've developed um, a wide variety of different tools. I already mentioned our monthly newsletter, which is probably our most important uh, and most effective tool. We also use social media a little less effectively, and we can speak maybe later about why that doesn't work. But uh, we also have local chapters called Stammtische. Uh, those among you who speak German uh, know that's a term for getting together and having drinks once a month, and that's pretty much what these people do. Uh, not exclusively, but, but it's deliberately a social effort that we don't really engage with unless they want us to. Um, the lo there's a local Stammtisch here in DC, for example, they meet once a month, they do great work. Um, and uh, one of the things that they do there is answer questions like, how, how did you tip in the United States, for example? Um, you know, you just got here, how can we help you with cultural issues that you might run, run into, or also with, um, uh, you recently went on the job market in Germany, can you uh, help me uh, with some recommendations and so on. So that's very bottom up, we don't really get involved with that. And then there's top down where we have our conferences, workshops, we use uh, webinars which work extremely well, and I think I'm probably out of time, um, but yeah, that's, that's what we do. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that none of you are ever going to succeed in academia because you all met your time limits. <laughs> and I've never met a successful academic who could keep their talk within the allotted time. So you could be a success in a lot of other places, but um, <laughs> not filling the air. Um, anyway, but that gives us lots of time for questions, and let's uh, have lots of opportunity to interact with all of you. So let's get started here. I'll start off by saying I'm not a postdoc, since I'm literally a little teen in the world of PhD, and this is the first year of being of it, so I'm just starting off, and I went into the world with like 20 other types. Um, I'm also not doing my PhD within the US, um, quite frankly, but I am doing it just because it's easier to do it abroad than mm -hmm. doing it in the US. Um, so my question is, what happens to a US citizen getting their PhD abroad who wants to come back? Because they're the one who fall within that gap of no one Social psychology, social psychology, and migration policy. So, yet another gap that I fall into. <laughs> you know, I, th I think that's probably um, less true that no one wants to do social psychology than slave brings us to life sciences. Uh -huh. And I think, again, I mean, I don't know, I don't have an answer for you because I don't have any data to help you. But I would guess that the, the most important thing you can do is publication still, even if you get your degree in Spain, if you have the right publication. Anybody else in the audience can help her with that? Part? Well, we, we have, I know David Proctor um, got his PhD in the United States and then did his postdoc in Scotland, so he might be able to help us and you as well. All right, let's start with David and then over here. Sure, my experience actually working with the NPA's equivalent in the UK, the Research Association, and a lot of the Americans that are doing their uh, degrees, their, po their postdocs in Britain, is uh, it, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to get an academic job, then you have to continue to produce good products larger publications, longer publications, and coming back, actually one of the most important things you do is come back to conferences and make sure that your people have it fresh. Um, if you want to do other things, such as I tried to get into science policy, I was very lucky to meet Kevin and to work at the Academy first, now at the AAASO, uh, working at the National Science Foundation, and we're very fortunate that in the U.S., at least in science policy, there are vehicles for that process. Um, if you wanted to do science policy somewhere else, then you'd have to talk to other people in the room about what their options are. And the same is true for science journalism, other sorts of uh, pursuits. You just have to figure out what it is that you're going to be evaluated by and make sure that you have those sorts of credentials. Um, and I, a lot of my colleagues went down to do science journalism. They returned home 
Okay. So if you just mm -hmm. want to, at this point, if you just want to focus on the PhD based outcome, based based on the research, then your most important thing that would help you remain in research is your publication, and impact factor and the H index that you would receive. So before you apply the last year, you should think about how many papers you have. That is the one most important thing that would help you. Nothing else. <laughs> I would disagree. Well, yeah. I mean, if she doesn't know anybody, then you gotta keep your network fresh, like David said. Okay, you also have to come in. Okay, my name is uh, Dr. Henrietta Osara, and uh, I have my PhD here in the United States in information system and technology. And uh, in an effort to help uh, Africans in Russia, so we formed the association called the Nigerian Women PhD Holders. So this includes all the women PhD holders worldwide. But what we are doing is to serve both developing and developed countries. So now we have, uh, just like you mentioned about research, which I'm very, very impressed on, that's a very critical point in postdoc and doctoral fellows. So you need to keep up in publication and also peer review other people's publications. Like mm -hmm. right now, we are accepting a, um, peer reviewers. Peer reviewers are people who can review other people's research so that you can also correct them and be able to put impact in other people's research. And while you're trying to review people's research, you, can, you are also gaining more knowledge on your own research because you can see how everything was structured. So now I'm going to pass this pamphlet around. We are going to have a conference next year, and uh, our publication will be out, which uh, we have already gotten an ISSN number with the US Library of Congress. It's a peer review international journal that focus on a lot of leadership, social, um, and other business factors. And even we are also including the STEM programs, which is the science, technology, in, in engineering, and math. So all this is geared towards helping the developed countries to keep up on the research process, because most of them, after going to school, they still find it difficult on how to research, how to analyze their research, and how to be able to find solutions to the problems because the essence of research is we're trying to solve a problem. And when you cannot be able to analyze the data, that data is worthless. So the key thing is how do we analyze these results? So I think um, it's going to benefit if we all can be able to collaborate together in order to help the less privileged and people who doesn't have the opportunity which we already have acquired here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, right here. Um, so, you, how many or what percent of the diaspora postdocs actually have family with them and maybe children in the U.S.? Well, um, about a third of all postdocs have a, a partner mm -hmm. and have children. So, does that present special problems when you have children? Yeah, that's really when you have children. <laughs> I, I think that um, the, the biggest problems that you face when you bring a family with you is that the compensation is so low for postdocs. Right now, according to the last science and engineering indicators that the NSF put out in 2012, the average salary for a postdoc across all disciplines, it does differ from discipline to discipline, was about 42000 a year. And also the other issue with bringing a family are the lack of, of benefits for the family usually. There are many postdocs don't have benefits for themselves, but many institutions do not provide benefits for families. And so I think it's more of the quality of life that bringing a family with that, that problem creates. And that, you know, for some visas, and uh, Brendan can speak on this if I'm wrong, but some of them don't allow the spouse to work. And so then again, they have to work or live on that 42,000 year. So off the top of my head, that's probably one of the bigger problems. Well, Gary's person in so, Yeah, I mean, uh, you asked about the challenges. I mean, uh, besides the um, monetary concerns, uh, another big problem is for your spouse can't work for the two to seven years that you're here in the United States. That creates uh, an um, unsurmisable gap in your in your resume, right? So a lot of people go back and they may find a job, but their husband uh, may not have a resume that looks just as good. So um, it's extra difficult for these people. So, so the other thing
interesting with um, having international fellows who come over with families, and, and one of the challenges that we help them with, if possible, is understanding the American system. So how do you get daycare? What is daycare? Um, also, uh, that what, what is the school system like locally? So kindergarten, how does that differ? What am I expected to do? How much am I expected to participate in my child's education here in the United States versus abroad? So um, I have a son, I had him when I was a postdoc, and it's really interesting now that he's in elementary school. How many other postdocs have kids in the school where my son goes? And so how we spend a lot of time educating everyone on the American education system. And I imagine this is true no matter where you go. So if I were to go to Germany, I'd have the same questions. Um, the other thing uh, is that across the states, a lot of places do things for the spouse, even if they don't work. So at the NIH, we have a, a group called, it's called the International Women's Group, uh, but it's for everyone, um, but it's for these, because it, traditionally it was the male coming over with a female spouse who couldn't work, so this is a place for um, all the spouses to get together and have play dates and things like that. For example, another interesting one is at the University of California at Berkeley, their visiting scholars program provides whole courses on American culture, and um, you know they have one courses on the uh, American education system and how do you improve your language skills, and how do you find a job, even if it's just volunteering. So across the nation, postdoc offices have kind of seen this and have had tried to help, but um, it's hard when there's limited resources when you're just trying to help the postdocs that you have, yet alone their family. I wanted to add to that, you know, personally I have seen a lot of postdocs with visiting status have families. So it's not like uh, it's not, and many, Agencies they are couple friendly. It's not that the spouses they have a year here and a month here and they can work. They can obviously volunteer and with NIH, for example, I'm on a J1. My spouse can work on a J2. She has a PhD. She was a UCLA postdoc, so she gets something you know where she can move along. And I have seen this with two more postdocs in my own department. So I'm thinking you know, if there is a possibility and there is a relevance in some, with somebody's CV, it's, it's a possibility. Okay, um, we're back here, here, and then here. This is the order I saw them. Unless somebody has something to follow up directly on this. All right, next one, back behind you, and then, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm Alan Harris from the Department of State. Um, everybody's talking about gender issues and yet I haven't heard what the various networks represented here have in terms of that uh, gender fraction. Can you comment? So what is the postdoc population gender, the gender? I'm 50-50. Yeah. yeah, at NIH, okay. Um, nationally, there is, it's about 58% men and 42% women. However, if you break that down between citizenship, with citizenship, oh yeah. Um, there are more um, domestic women mm -hmm. postdocs and more um, international men postdocs. Yes. Yeah, I would yes. say I would say in our network, uh, it's about the 52, 48, 52 men, 48 women. Uh, but um, obviously, once you know, and I, th I don't know if that reflects Max. I don't know if you know that in terms of um, the science community in Germany in general, if that's if that's representative of what's going on in Germany. Depends on the career stage. Uh, uh, it, at about the PhD plus two years level, it's uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but I mean, the higher th that's why I mean, the higher you go, and I think that's what you're implying. The the stronger it leans towards um, men. Like the higher you go in the career level, but um, mm -hmm. in terms of our net network, it's probably almost 50 50. I mean, the trend in the postdocs is that it's becoming more female and more minority, at least according to Paula. Stefan over the last decade or so. And, you know, which is a good thing that it's inviting groups that were underrepresented before to become part of the community. But it's a bad sign is that whenever that happens, there's a tendency for wages not to keep pace and that the advantaged community moves on to other opportunities where there's better pay. So, um, so it's, it's an important consideration 
that uh, you know that it remain high status jobs and appealing jobs to all parts of the population as well as providing um, openings for everybody. At, at VFC, we have uh, almost 45 to 55 ratio, but most of the leadership positions are 50-50. Hi, I'm Renetta Collin. I'm from UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and we have a new postdoc office that's doing what's the grad students are now postdocs are now part of um, the, my, um, the offices in my office. I'm wondering about emerging international markets or or areas where there are jobs. I was I was really um, thinking about this idea of career prospects, and so as we're training. Um, both our graduates and our postdocs to get jobs. Are there places where there are quite a few opportunities and places and, and ways in which we should be training them? So, for example, I have um, some colleagues in other areas who were getting jobs in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, are there certain skills that I should be learning about so that I can pass those on to my colleagues? So that's, that's a tough question. And the reason it's a tough question is because um, what the skill needs in Dubai may not be what the skill needs are in Brazil. And if you want to go work in Brazil, you have to take a test in order to become a government employee. And it just it's so broad that you may end up driving yourself a little bit, spreading yourself a little thin as you try to look at all the emerging markets. You know, if you think about the big emerging markets, it's Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That's it, that's exactly what I mean. Brick. Uh, that's brick. Okay. Right? So if you look at yeah. the emerging markets across the, India yeah. is putting in a lot of money in research and development, as well as China. Okay. You know, if you look at where nature has opened offices or science has opened offices, they're opening offices in India and China and Brazil and uh, I don't know if they're opening offices in Russia yet or not. But if if you're looking at those kind of things, those were our those are the big growth markets. But it's what the bigger thing is, I think, with like that's why we use our, our visiting fellows group is to can maintain a connection. So, for example, this morning the Wealthy Trust DBT was on campus talking about opportunities if you want to go back to India. Mm -hmm. But it's maintaining networks because you're going to spread yourself too thin as a postdoc office, understanding all the career things for every single nation. Mm -hmm. right. And I also say they differ a great deal according to discipline. Yes. You might get better information by talking, if you're an electrical engineer, talking to IEEE rather than to a, a larger group because the job markets vary a great deal. Are there requirements, also. projections, so on? There. Yeah, um, what we tell our um, um, members uh, is that um, the, the thing German universities are looking for if they want to hire, and a lot of them um, do, I mean, there's a great uh, shortage of uh, academics in Germany right now, which is why they pay somebody like me sort of recruit the Germans back from, uh, so what from about here. -Germans are you recruiting them? Hmm? People who are not Germans are you recruiting them? Uh, uh, yep. I don't recruit them, <laughs> but, there, but there is a, but there is a yes. uh, basically funded by yeah. the exact same organization that, that funds my job, so to speak, uh, are uh, called Research in Germany. Uh, they uh, are strongly and heavily recruiting uh, international scholars as well. So there's a shortage. And what, what we tell people is uh, international experience uh, which obviously the Germans who are here right now have, but um, so that's, that's a general, almost, uh, it can be internationally mobile, be internationally networked, and, you know, publications. I mean, we, we mentioned this before. I mean, I think I think what a person that wants, uh, that is looking to hire, will look at is uh, mostly what the site of scholarly record is, or how, how it's actually published, what has been done, um, and then everything else sort of follows. I think, you know, writing is still and networking that most important things where your writing is skills if you want to stay in research. And I'm saying research in terms of not only teaching, but actually doing research, you need to generate grants where wherever you are. That's the bottom line. You know, you can stay at to a certain level where you can become an assistant research professor or some other rank of that level. But to go to the next level, whether you are here or outside, you need to understand how to write grants in the perspective of that country, policy, you know, whatever field they are in, they have to really understand how to write it. So that's, that's one of the most important things that is there. 
know, how to write grants, how to do networking, how to understand and assess the, uh, the university. Thank you. And we just have a word of caution um, mm -hmm. to to make sure that you, you communicate to the postdocs that it will be competitive probably wherever they go because now what's happening is other countries are, are trying to develop mm -hmm. a postdoc position, whatever they call it. So mm -hmm. I have a university in Moscow, they called me, emailed me wanting advice on how to start a postdoc office. And South Africa has a very, uh, grow much right now their research account is growing and they've started uh, their postdoc network. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my goal is that with these new postdoc networks or levels of, of, of employment that are starting these countries are learn lessons from what we've done in the United States. Mm -hmm. But so there, it, going to another country may be the answer, but they must, they realize that now these other countries are also doing that sort of labor, and so they're gonna be competing with those, those people in that country. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and also, I mean, it, it just quickly, it varies from country to country and, and their willingness to, to hire internationals mm -hmm. in, into their network. I mean, the United States is often a complaint that we are too willing to hire non-citizens. Why aren't we hiring the citizens first that went to school here? And you know, you're in very, very demanding, very highly skilled um, occupations. And they just say, the employers say, look, we want the very best person, we don't care where that person comes from. Now, that might be true here, or in some industries here, in some places here, not in all. So it's, it's, it's really hard, there's just a, a lot to learn, and I don't, it would be hard to give any general advice, I think is, is what you're, you're hearing from the panel, um, you know. Except, you know, be as good as you can be, and, um, <laughs> and try it out. You're next, and then then over here. Something for sure in this American thing. You have a lot of foundations for one of your organizations that works with the uh, One of the things that we try and do is convince more U.S. or Western researchers to consider an international research system as opposed to like overseas. And we run into a lot of resistance. We can probably say a lot of the reasons that many of you have mentioned. But it's complicated. It's, there's concerns about reentry and about losing networks and not hearing about opportunities, all of those things. And that's why, Laura, I want to come back to a comment that you made in citing three. The next big challenge will be to help bring circulation across the world. You know, we need to prepare our postdocs to be doing job searches around the world. And I think that's really true, but we've also seen how difficult it is in mean, sharing information, having access to information that you don't have. So I'm just going to ask you, maybe to start, if you had your druthers and unlimited budget, what has to change with the post office offices and the services in order to be preparing for brain circulation? New patterns in the brain. I don't know if it actually has to be within the post office or within making sure that we connect to the various countries, organizations, like your access. Your Access is a fantastic organization for all of Europe to kind of think about this mobility. But one of the challenges is here in DC, we're very lucky in that the embassies are down the street, and so we just go bother them. <laughs> um, and our fellows go to their own embassies or to other embassies, or they go to open houses on the weekend. And so there's this kind of sharing of information. We need to take this kind of community that we've built in the DC area and make sure that it continues in New York and in San Francisco. And I know the Von Humboldt po Foundations are very good because you do the things in all the different areas, but it's one specific, it's just Germany. We need to make sure that we're doing it across from every single community. So we'd love to have, if I had all the money in all the world, someone would create a website to funnel all this stuff into. Yes, and then here. So So to that I wanted to comment, I had a very close interaction with a Brazilian, <coughs> Brazilian uh, representative from Sao Paulo during our exposition. 
they have very good programs they offer competitive postdoctoral salary as much as in us or even more some in some places but there are certain issues that one other scientist or researcher has to understand as well while going there is to what is the language that they have to submit for their proposal in. so when we started talking about in that exposition seminar many south american postdocs they were very happy but on the other hand those who speak english or want to communicate in, in, in english it becomes a barrier for them because the submission is only in in the language spoken in brazil so even though they may pay equivalent of usd 3500 or 4000 dollars for a postdoc or to an early career researcher even more than that how they are going to use that money so it's very important to make them understand how they get, they are going to approach do they need somebody to help them or a senior investigator so that they can collaborate with them and then move along with the process so that they can generate the money that is available there as well Okay, just to quickly follow up on, on what Francis said. The other thing to think about, and I, whenever I talk to young people about what they're going to do with their careers, is they're going to make it up as they go along. <laughs> I mean, it's a truism that the world is changing so quickly, that the structures are changing, that the best jobs are in companies that didn't exist 20 years ago. So um, part of what you're going to do is you have a lot of skill and a lot of ability and a lot of energy. You might make it up as you go along. You might not want to go. Many of you won't go on a tenure track position. Many will or maybe you're not going to wind up in the country you thought you were going to wind up in. But, um, but you just, I mean, it's always important to think in more creative ways because, you know, this generation of scientists and engineers that comes up is going to do different things than the previous ones did. Their institutions are going to change. MOOCs might wipe them all out. Who knows what's <laughs> going to happen? So, um, you know, you, know, you do need to prepare for what's out there, you know, for the publishing ex as it exists, for the way hiring is done, for the way companies are hiring. But many of you aren't going to wind up there. So um, I think Lori's program and probably others are trying to also prepare you mm -hmm. for those, the opportunities that we don't know um, exist yet. Here we go. Uh, here. Okay. Um, I'm a professor of chemistry at Tyson University. That's my day job. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also a coach with the, the Committee for the Advancement of Women in Chemistry. And um, part of what we do sort of has been mentioned in the room uh, this afternoon. Um, but I think I'll just talk about the international efforts that we currently have. And uh, part of what we do is go to, we've been to several different countries and we conduct workshops uh, with women, um, that women faculty, graduate students, postdocs, and also administrators that are geared towards you know, helping and working with uh, these scientists in advancing their uh, careers in science. And part of what uh, we encounter, um, in January we're in Kenya, and part of what the postdocs and graduate students were telling us was they want to know uh, how to prepare CVs, how to uh, put together grant proposals or uh, prepare manuscripts for uh, publication. And what we found that we started doing is kind of doing what you're doing, but then in Morocco <coughs> and in Kenya and in South Africa and in these other countries. So I just wanted to um, uh, mention that. And um, these networks that we create are generated precisely because we have scientists in the U.S. who are members of the diaspora who want to establish connections back to their own countries. And so these what I'll call missions to uh, different countries are spearheaded by uh, foreign-born bo faculty and postdocs in the U.S. And it's just an interesting contribution, I think, to the whole idea of brain circulation. There's a lot of those groups. So one is WAVE, which is the World Academy of Young mm -hmm. Scientists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. World Association, sorry, that's mm -hmm. close. <laughs> um, the other one, the New York Academy of Sciences has an interesting program called Scientists Without Borders. Um, the Paul Nurse has a, um, uh, the Nobel Laureate Paul Nurse has a, a, a large um, mission work kind of for to take scientists.
just abroad, so you just the kind of thing. And again, it's all these small groups going all over. Bio Biovision also has some really interesting things for early career researchers. So there, there's no one, oh, Coach is coming to Kenya this month. Let's make sure that everybody right. knows about right. it. Yes, yes. That's, we don't have that. Uh, I wanted to add in that uh, in India there is a um, there is a way to get the senior or junior level scientists who are here or abroad and they do it in a very scientific way. If you, I don't know how many people here have heard about YBM, but this is an organization that actually asks the junior level scientists and postdocs to come with their abstracts and they conduct a conference in Boston, and in that, every single person who has an abstract there becomes eligible to get interviewed, and the exhibitors are from top-level universities or organizations, agencies, editorial boards, journals. They come there, they hire people, and they get their jobs in that conference and go to India to work. So it is a very good opportunity where all the exhibitors in terms of the university representatives and the scientists who merge there and get to the exhibit and achieve their work for whatever expectation they are coming for, which is either to get hired or to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. So this is a very good networking approach that I think you know, some of the agencies they are using. Yeah, um, I I want to play maybe just for a second the devil's advocate for a moment, and um, I think I can do that because it's the type of concern that we hear a lot from our uh, members, um, and we shouldn't make it sound like just if you know how to write a CV in a particular country, you're going to get a job there, and even if you do get a job, what type of job is that? One of the reasons it's so difficult for me to convince a lot of the Germans here in the United States to come back to Germany is not because research in Germany is, is not excellent or there aren't good jobs, but it's very risky business to be internationally mobile on this, uh, on this type of level. I mean, you mentioned before when we say early career, uh, early st career researchers, we're talking about people who are in their early 30s, maybe late 30s, um, and then to uproot maybe your family already and take them back to Germany to do another postdoc mm -hmm. or maybe uh, do an assistant professorship that may be guaranteed funding only for four or five years, it's extremely risky. And one of the things that we do, we don't just advertise Germany to, to this clientele, but we also take these types of concerns that are brought to us at conferences and so on, <coughs> and bring them to high-ranking policymakers in Germany. A lot of the attendees at our uh, main conference, and uh, the annual conference, are um, not just people offering jobs, but they're also politicians, um, deputy secretaries of state, and so on, people who um, are involved in science policy making on a very high level. And we bring them together with these young postdocs who maybe want to go back to Germany, but are just not um, too enticed by a two-year postdoc at the University of, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Germany, and so uh, so we bring them together and 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 um, let the science diaspora talk to these policymakers and tell them their concerns, and uh, and I think um, it's important to keep in mind it's not just I mean, a skill set that you need to train and then everything will be good, but but you know it's very risky business, especially at this side, the stage of your career, and you kind of um, need to create an environment that is uh, welcoming also on a, on a career basis. Wait, here first, and then here. This is an answer to that All right. question. All right. So I'm from the Department of State, um, and we have, I just want to say a little bit about NODES, which is the Networks of Diasporas for Engineers in Engineering and Science. It's a partnership between the Department of State, AAAS, and the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering. And what <coughs> we're trying to do is really pull together some of these science diaspora groups and really enable them. And so we had a meeting in Boston at the AAAS meeting. We just published a report from that. And on the AAAS uh, part of their website for science diplomacy, there's a list of 40 different science diaspora groups. Mm -hmm. There's some reports and lessons learned. And one of the things I'll say is at the AAAS meeting, we had a young woman from Turkey who spoke about TASA, which is the Turkish American Scholars and Scientists Association. 
for the Sciences and Scholars Association, and how valuable that was to her as a postdoc and as a young faculty, because she plugged into a network of people who were already in the U.S., Turk, Turks, mm -hmm. Turkish Americans in the U.S., and got all kinds of advice about jobs, about how things are done, people who would read her publications or read her um, uh, grant proposals, uh, how to set up a lab, how to mentor people. And then now that she has a position, she also has access to the best students from Turkey coming here, and she's mentoring them. And so it's been, she said it was extremely valuable to her professional development to have these kinds of connections. So what we're trying to do is bring the folks together, enable them to learn from each other, because there are so many diasporas out there volunteering and working to give back, but without the networks and the platforms, it's extremely time consuming and not terribly efficient. So ways that we can bring them together. So we'll have some information out there uh, for okay. anybody who's interested. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shireen uh, from Center of Operation Malaysia. So my function is basically like Garrett, you know, but covering all sectors. Because Malaysia is a uh, fast growing country and we have a lot of opportunities. My question would be, yes, I have challenges. And, and basically what I do is I look after Malaysian abroad, Malaysian diaspora abroad, and we reach out to them and connect with them, you know, and uh, in a way, if we can convince them to come back or contribute from wherever they are as part of the brain population. What I'm hearing now is that, you know, we have one end of it, which is Germany and Malaysia in this case, uh, having the demand for the researchers, and I'm hearing from the other end saying that, you know, you are coaching them, trying to find a job, trying to find opportunities and stuff. So what is the demand and supply situation now for the researchers? Because, you know, I'm just trying to see a bigger perspective of things uh, from that angle. I'll just, I would like to hear from Sam, maybe just. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> so you could have a, whole, a conference just on supply and demand. <laughs> no, I'm just here. Uh, yeah. We, uh, there are, I've heard two different philosophies or theories from economists about the supply and demand. And the only thing I can speak to is that the supply and demand in the United States, because I, I don't know enough about the global. But um, that some people think that there are too many researchers in the United States, to, you know, and we need to start, uh, not slow down how many PhDs are graduating from that. And others think that there's not enough. And that we need more, and that we, and that, and I'm currently the United States is heavily dependent upon foreign-born researchers to get the research done. So I don't have an answer for you. It would be wonderful if we could uh, do brain circulation in a way that it benefits every country a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It just seems like that, you know. Right. Yeah. Not about I mean, some people think that, and many people think that. Where's the data? <laughs> exactly. Don't and you that have data? In some cases, we, we did not. I mean, one of the things is that nobody collects information on postdocs who did not get their PhDs in the United States. And that might be half of the postdocs, and nobody tracks them. So we don't know whether they get jobs, at what level their jobs are, how many return, how many things. We simply don't know. And our report in 2000 said that the National Science Foundation, which does keep track of people who get their PhDs in the United States, should extend that, that survey research to include people who come here. And they nodded their heads, and it's 13 years later, and they're still not collecting it, so we'll but probably recommend it again. But they are getting closer. The, the, the National Science Foundation is working on the early career doctorate survey, and that will capture more people who did not earn their, United, their degree in the United States. But the pilot of that is going to happen probably um, the end of this year, so we're still two years away from having that data. But you could you could got you could gather from the PI information, right? I mean, those postdocs are being funded by a grant. This is the first year, as of recently, that you had to report who you were funding on an R01. Right. So this as, as of this year. Yeah. So we don't, and that's just one grant mechanism. That's from the NIH. That doesn't include grant mechanisms from the NSF or NASA or DOE, which each have their own separate and disparate rules and regulations about what you have to report and doesn't funnel into the overall larger governmental system. But the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy is aware of this issue, uh -huh. and so they're working on different um, possibilities, like a universal identifier, things like that, oh, but it's I all mean, very much in the future. Should, there should be a way that there's just 
Brandon Medea, who actually worked with the Office of Fossil Research of the University and collect that data collected. They don't even know. Pat, many of them don't know who their postdocs are. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I know. This is the problem with people working on research grants. Their, their status within their universities is often very ambiguous. And some of them are with those employees and some other status. Um, it's, it's confusion. Kathy could tell you stories. That's why, they, I mean, that's why there's such a sense of disenfranchisement among postdocs. Because what happens is the PI has that independence to hire whom they want. They don't necessarily go through the Human Resources Office many times. So unless postdocs are tracked through the Human Resources Office, they are non-entities on the campus. Many of them can't even get library cards. And so you go to the, the postdoc offices, have do, are, they're doing a fantastic job. In 2003, we had fewer than 20 postdoc offices at research institutions in the United States. Now, the best data I can come with, we have over 135. So it has improved. And they are, these, these people are on the front lines working for these postdocs, doing everything they can to track the postdocs in the universities. And many of them are now being tracked from the resources. But the problem is, it'll probably be another decade before you could go to any institution that has a postdoc and say, how many postdocs do you have? This is uh, at NIH. Oh, yeah. At NIH, there is an alumni group uh, where people can add where they went, but it's very, premature at this point. <laughs> I have seen those uh, listings, but many of them, they don't report. One of the other biggest challenges in postdoc education is we have no teeth. We have no, you have to do this or you can't do that. Um, because um, many of them are not employees or they're not fully regulated from the university structure or the research institution structure. So we have no if then. <laughs> Um, consequences. Right. It's not tied to funding. It's not tied to funding. You're not tied to HR. I know it's shocking. It's scary. There, we don't have anything. We can't make people join our alumni database. We can't make people come to orientation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The back side of that kind of funnel back to like my issue about, um, and then the issue that you mentioned about purely things like what are your rights on in the office or in the lab setting that. You so if you're not accountable on paper, and we like looking at numbers and paper because behind all of that there's power and there's responsibility and recognition of who's responsible, um, then we have issues with like how much how much of the postdoc being abused within their work setting. It's changing a lot. It has as, as much as we say we have some we make yeah. a drama, um, it's changed a lot because now you have to have every postdoc who every person on in NIH R01 grant has to have their own unique identifier, ERA Commons. So we can track people, but that, like I said, just started. The other challenge is that um, the postdoc offices do their best to collect all the different categories of postdocs and then see how much everybody is paid. So we're trying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, but we both about it. One of the concerns is that postdocs are, are paying are paying their postdocs far too little because we can import people from around the world who are willing no to doubt. work for lower salaries or don't know what the salary means in the United States and it might look very appealing. <laughs> and they're here and then because of visa restrictions, they don't have much freedom to move, they don't have much recourse if they have a problem with their PI. So I mean, there's a, a real concern, I think, about diaspora issues um, related to this, and many of them can be fixed by formalizing the rules, the status, the benefits, the rights, the intellectual property, to credit on publications, to all a number of things. And, and Laurie and Kathy and others have been working on this for a long time, but it's been a real slow process, and, uh, and there are incremental improvements, and, and they continue to be made, but there's, we're nowhere near where we should be on this. We don't have a Ministry of Higher Education. <laughs> <laughs> well, get over here and fix it. <laughs> import. Yeah, we'll go import your but, minister. But positively, on a positively <laughs> note, most of the postdocs that I talk to that, even if they have issues, they still want to do it because it, it gives them that time to do some independent research um, before they have to worry about doing more than that, if you know what I mean. Once they become, you know, so they still love it. But there are issues that I'd say the most important thing for those of you who are considering doing a postdoc, I don't know how many of you are in the audience, is do your homework and negotiate. Before you sign anything, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. 
Okay. Actually, I had and one question, and, and just from your own personal experience, what do you know about the motivation of people who come to do their postdoc here? And my guess is it differs where you're coming from and so on, but and if you're coming to it from a country that has very few PhDs, never mind postdocs, <coughs> are you really thinking that a postdoc is going to put you in a higher position when you can get a university job without a PhD? Um, whereas, you know, someone coming from Germany where there are the very competitive university system and so on, you know, might come because you think it'll give you leverage back home. Mm, I think we have yeah. some German postdocs in the audience. Yeah. Okay, well, well I don't know. I'm just going to speak for them. Um, I, I, the organizations that fund GAIN or that are behind GAIN are the ones that actually spend money bringing people abroad. Uh, in the first place, like I said earlier, and, and the motivation is, is very uh, clear. I mean, it, you just, you're a better researcher if you have a certain degree of international exposure. You're a better researcher if you have international networks. You're a better researcher if you have um, sort of uh, the experience, the immersion into another uh, research system for a while. Uh, it's not so much anymore that research is better over here. That, that used to be probably a motivation in a lot. 15 or 20 years ago. Nowadays, I think uh, the, the systems are pretty competitive, but, but, the, but the idea that, that you sort of, uh, somebody once called it uh, sort of an experience osmosis or, or, or cultural osmosis that you then sort of bring back to Germany and, and hopefully bring back at some point and uh, enrich the German system. Right? So that's from a funding perspective why we send people abroad. And the other thing, I mean, that would be probably the motivation for the researchers themselves as well, and, and for others it's maybe also, I mean, I'm a PhD candidate myself, I, I did, I got a degree in Germany, and now here I'm getting a PhD, and for me it's an adventure, right? It's not, it's not so much that I feel like a PhD here is worth more, or um, um, something that I, that I really need to advance back in Germany, or even here, but, but it's, it's, it started out as an adventure, and now I'm, I'm facing actually the very same problems that our members face and sort of become my own client. <laughs> so obviously, I wanted to give a very unique perspective on this because this is very true about some of the countries in Asia. What is the age index of the country in time? It's very important. It also tells what is your impact factor of the journal, where you are publishing. Every country's researchers, they want to publish in their own country first. If not, then to top level journals. Why? Because it's applicable to them. What is the mean impact factor of journals in India or China or in US? There is a huge difference. Most of the Chinese and Indian journals, they don't go beyond two or three impact factor. In US, you can see ranging from zero to 54. So what is the perspective for a researcher coming here, getting and working for the same thing, but getting high impact factor journals, whereas staying there, knowing that if it doesn't go to a science cell of nature, where would it land? And then what is the, what is the time frame in which they can get those publications? If they don't get it early, then obviously they are gonna have difficulty or they have to elongate their postdoctorship. So this is one, one major criteria that people, when coming from developing countries, they face is what if they do a postdoctorship in their own country or a similar platform where they may not be able to get an impact factor for the same publication if they do it in a developed country. Same research, but if it goes to a local journal, it has a very high impact. So it gives them an opportunity to go up the ladder faster than what they can do in their home country. Okay, um, we've got about three minutes left. So any last comments, any things we didn't touch on that you wish you had the chance to say? Any other panelists? I, I would, I guess there's just one thing. We did, we, you brought up gender and I just wanted to mention that we um, had a National Science Foundation grant to explore gender issues and we, we uh, did some focus groups and it, it found that um, the international postdocs, and these were women in the focus group, they experienced an even greater sense of isolation than other postdocs. And all the issues that we talked about seem to be magnified for them. And so um, keep in mind that is that 
gender also plays a role in the issues faced by this population. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, well, they'll be up here afterwards if you want to come back on. Uh, no, I uh, just wanted to say if I could uh, have a word of advice from my point of view, and I'm sorry to contradict you, because uh, uh, I, I hope uh, people are not focusing too much on the impact factor, because that is a red herring sometimes. The important is the impact of one's own research and not, and not the venue. So just as a word of caution to us. I'm quite sure what you're saying is correct, uh, but if you I kept forgetting I was there and standing in front of it, so... I was going to... I'm trying, I'm trying to remember to step back, I don't know what the angle was. Okay, I'll probably hang around just to see if this conversation My organization we work but we don't build capacity for other fields. that make sense? Thank you. 